Our next speaker has, I think, one of the most brilliantly bonkers CVs I've ever read. Oscar Scafidi is a travel writer, he's an international teacher, and he's an African political risk and security consultant. You know, one of those portfolio careers young people have these days. Um, he collates and analyzes specialist intelligence for commercially relevant political and violent risks, mainly in Lusophone Africa and Somalia. He also does stuff on Somali piracy. He writes Brad travel guides and he teaches history. So who better then to tell us about his completion of the first source to sea passage down the longest river in Angola? Oscar Scafidi. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So I'd like to start my talk with a brief clip from day 20 of our expedition. What's going on, Alfie? <laughs> We've had to bail to the side. <laughs> yeah, the locals made a beeline for the tree and said, get in the tree. The reason being, grumpy Mr. Hippo. Can you hear him? He's kind of chased us into the corner. I don't know if you can see. Uh, you can, that's not very good at all. That's a hippo anyway. I think he's coming over here, so let's see. But anyway, he's, he's, he's certainly not scared of the boat, and he's not shy. He came right up to us. So, we're hungry, we're tired, we're filthy, we're behind schedule, and we're stuck up a tree because of that hippo. <laughs> the question I'd like to address this evening is the same question that Alfie and I were asking ourselves as we're up that tree. How did we end up in this situation? So I'd like to address four areas in this talk. Uh, firstly, why did we choose Angola? And then why did we choose to support the Halo Trust? And talk a bit about our preparations, what some of the challenges were that we faced, and finish by talking about the impacts of our journey. So why Angola? Well, Angola was my home for five years, uh, up until 2014. I was working there as a history teacher in an international school, and I was also writing the Brat Travel Guide to Angola, which you can see there, a bit of a shameless plug. <laughs> Um, Alfie was also there, uh, he was the country manager for a company called Swire, that's actually how we met, um, and he was actually still there in 2016 when we began the expedition. Um, so, the Kwanzaa actually appealed to us, firstly because no one had ever tried this before, so this is uh, the longest river in Angola and no one that we could find out about had actually kayaked along it, uh, and also Alfie told me it was doable, which is always an important part. So. Alfie and his brothers had actually done about 220 kilometers of the journey uh, previously, and he thought that that journey could be scaled up so that we could complete the entire journey. So why the Halo Trust? Well, in 2013, when I traveled around the country, I had the opportunity to visit all 18 provinces. And one of the provinces I visited was down in the southeast. It's up there. It's called Cuando Cubango. And a town called Cuito Carnavale really stuck in my mind. Now, sadly, Cuito Carnavale has the label of Africa's most landmined town. The reason for this being that between 1975 and 2002, Angola suffered a serious civil war, and it still bears the scars of that today. So the Halo Trust are the world's largest humanitarian landmine clearance organization, and they've been working down in Cuito Carnavale for years and years. Now, it's their hope to have a landmine-free world by 2025, but unfortunately, Angola is a country of concern for them, uh, because the place is just so severely affected by landmines. So there on the left, you'll see some of the mines that we were shown by the Halo Trust uh, over in one of their centers. And on the right, quite a familiar feature if you drive around the countryside in Angola. That's a destroyed Soviet helicopter. You see tanks and all sorts of remnants of war as you travel around. Uh, and as you can see from the labor labeling on this Claymore mine uh, and the other unexploded ordnance, the stuff's come from all over the world. So it was a civil war, but there were all sorts of foreign powers interfering and selling them landmines that continue to affect them to this day. So we thought we're going to help the Halo Trust. Uh, the next question then, how did we prepare? Well, I was in London, Alfie was still in Angola, so our preparations were a little different. Here you can see Alfie himself, who is very sorry that he can't be here tonight. Uh, so he had access to the Kwanzaa River. He also had access to the Klepper kayak that we were going to be using for the journey. So that is a collapsible kayak that you see him in there. So there he is, swanning about on the Kwanzaa, nice and sunny, having a great time, really enjoying his training. As I said, I was in London, so 
There's me on pretty much the same day, not having a good time on the filthy, freezing River Thames, uh, trying my hardest not to fall in or swallow any of the water uh, or get hit by some of the traffic that moves up and down there. Uh, I didn't realize that apparently you can just get a kayak and do this. You don't need any kind of license or anything, which is quite surprising. So, as well as the physical training, we had different jobs to do to get ourselves ready. Uh, I was in charge of getting the kit and getting the sponsors, and there on the left is my 25 kilos of kit that we each had to carry. We also had to get all the food together. You see on the right, we had to have enough rations to last us at least a month out in the wilderness with no support. Uh, my girlfriend was a little bit sad to see that I bought a dehydrator and a vacuum sealer uh, and was obviously going to be using our house as the location for all of this. Uh, she's even sadder to find out that we we're going to be eating dehydrated tuna for most of the journey because obviously that made our house smell pretty bad during the preparation <laughs> process. Uh, I also had to get all the medical gear together in case there was an emergency because we we're going to be very isolated. And lastly, find a power system so that we could film the entire journey for our documentary. Alfie was in Angola, so he had some slightly different jobs. His most important one being to get the Klepper kayak ready. Now, there's the Klepper kayak. Uh, it's 50 years old, it's a, a German piece of engineering, and it's mainly made of wood, so it's about 40 to 45 kilos. As I said, he'd already done a good two to 300 kilometer journey with this with his brothers, who I believe are out there in the audience somewhere. So he knew this would work, he just needed to make sure that we had all the spare parts and we'd worked out who's gonna carry what. Uh, he was also in charge of getting us permits, no idea what permits we needed, but he, he was trying his best to deal with the Angolan bureaucracy, uh, work out the route, so he decided it's going to be 60 kilometers of kayaking or 20 of hiking, uh, and also the emer emergency evacuation points if there was an issue. So there's the route. Uh, so my next question is, what were the challenges? And you can see from there, we had a few challenges. I suppose there are four main challenges. Uh, the first was the cold. More serious than that was Within the first week or so, we sank the kayak, which wasn't great. Uh, we were also attacked by hippos, and then just to cap it off, we were arrested. So <laughs> to address those in order, we'll start with the cold. Now, getting hold of weather data for deepest, darkest Angola was extremely difficult. What we could get told us that it was probably not gonna be any colder than five degrees. Uh, we were wrong. So it went below zero for two weeks straight uh, at night time. So there's Alfie getting up in the morning, ready to kayak, wearing all the clothes that he, he owned on the entire trip. Still freezing cold, because he only had a two-season uh, two sleeping bag. Uh, and you can't see from the photos, but there's actually ice all over the tents and on the kayak. So quite, a difficult, uh, quite difficult to motivate ourselves in the morning to get up and get out on the water. Uh, I suppose more serious is we actually sank the kayak. Um, so fishermen like to build these wooden dams along the river and put fish traps in them. You can see the fish traps behind Alfie. Uh, rather cockily, I thought, wouldn't it be great if we film this with the GoPro while we skillfully navigate through that dam? <laughs> Uh, that's why I have a picture of Alfie there getting really upset because actually what we did is crash into the dam, snap the kayak in two and lose loads of our gear. Uh, you can actually see down there in the bottom right, uh, that is our water filtration system floating off down the Kwanzaa, <laughs> never to be seen again. So that was a two-day delay. We had to stop in a mining town called Kamakupa uh, and get a, the only local carpenter to basically fix all the snap parts of our kayak. Now, this carpenter normally spends his time making coffins uh, and chairs and things, so he was quite intrigued by this new job, but he did an excellent, excellent job of fixing all the snap bits, and we got back onto the river. Uh, the main actual danger uh, were the hippos. So they were a constant feature of the journey for the first three weeks. Um, and they're a lot more dangerous than people think they are. So they're not just big, friendly river cows. Uh, they kill a lot more people than any of the more sort of exotic mammals like lions that people would assume would be the main danger uh, in this part of Africa. So most of the time, thankfully, one of the, one of the few positive things about the Civil War is that because of the amount of poaching that happened, all of the hippos were quite conditioned to be afraid of people. So most of the time, they got out of our way before we saw them. Unfortunately, as you saw from the clip at the beginning, this guy had a very different idea. Um, so he actually chased us and was quite keen to sort of, sort of sink the boat or even get at us. So yeah, we were, it was a constant source of stress knowing that there are these massive creatures out there uh, that sometimes we're going over, we had to go round. Um, so we had to be really, really careful as we're doing that. And I suppose the last challenge uh, was getting arrested. So we camped next to a dam called Kapanda, which is a hydroelectric dam. We had all the permits, Alfie reassures me. Uh, but anyway, apparently that's a site of strategic interest, and so we were arrested for probably spying, I don't know. So they neglected to confiscate our filming gear, so there's me doing a live update from the prison cell with the GoPro camera. So anyway, uh, 
we were quite amused on the first night, but then sort of uh, four days later, we weren't so amused. So we were actually dragged 500 kilometers out of our way back to the capital city, and they tried to deport us. Um, I'm not sure what the exact charges were. So it's only thanks to the very kind intervention of the British and Italian embassies uh, and a couple of high-profile Angolan politicians that we're actually released and allowed to continue with our journey. So that was quite lucky. There's Alfie uh, looking a bit miffed in front of the uh, Melange Immigrant Detention Centre. So it's basically us, a bunch of Chinese guys, uh, and some Congolese people all being detained for various immigration violations, apparently. So what impacts did our journey have? Well, the aim of the journey was to raise 10,000 US dollars, which was basically to give Halo Trust enough money to do a month's worth of work down in Quito Carnival. Uh, which is Africa's most mined town. In the end, we managed to raise 25,000 US dollars. So I think people really took an interest in this trip with the sinking and the arrest and all the other disasters, which was good. So in the end, that 25,000 paid for these nine, this nine-man team uh, to remove 214 landmines from Quito Carnival. So that's 121 anti-personnel and 93 anti-tank. And that meant that they could return uh, lots of square kilometers uh, to the local population for productive use, which was fantastic. As well as that, uh, we collected, or I should actually say Alfie collected, because I don't know anything about birds, but we collected data on birds as we went down the river. Uh, quite a lot of that data ended up at the bottom of the river in the sinking, but <laughs> after that point, we were still able to hand over some useful information to the Wild Bird Trust. Uh, and lastly, we were actually able to film the journey, and we released a 45-minute documentary about it, uh, which you can find at kayaklaquanza.com. Thank you very much.